Um, so my name is Julie Brown. As I said, I'm the Raptor Migration and Programs Director at Humana. And um, Josh was pulled away last minute. So we have uh, my husband, Phil Brown, uh, the chair of Humana Tour Committee. He's going to be helping kind of um, run things today and answer questions at the end. Um, we really appreciate your support for Lunch and Learn. We've been offering this program for three years now this, this summer, and we love uh, this way of connecting with all of you. Um, so before I begin, I'll mention a few things. Um, we'll keep everybody muted for the duration of the presentation so we can be sure to hear Ryan well. Um, and we encourage you to engage with us and ask questions. That's what the chat window is for. Um, so go ahead and write any questions you have for him, and we will ask him at the end. Um, it's also a great place to share just where you're joining us from. Um, and um, if you've seen any cool raptors lately, uh, feel free to uh, add your email address as well if you don't already receive our, our e-newsletter, which goes out about once a month. Um, so that's a great way of just staying up to date with Humana News. And we will be live streaming on Facebook today. And um, we make all these presentations, uh, we record them and make them available on our website. Um, you can also watch them anytime on Facebook. Um, and before I introduce Ryan, uh, we do have um, um, a tour to Belize coming up this fall in November. And we do have our tour uh, guides with us here today. So Ronnie Martinez is here from Belize and Bill Clark, who's Humana, uh, who will be the Humana tour guide. So they're both here and available. If you have questions about the tour, maybe you're one of our registrants already signed up for it and you have questions about it um, or thinking about joining us. We have three openings uh, left. The tour is almost full. So uh, Ryan will, I'm sure, in addition to talking about uh, hook build kites, uh, also talk about the tour a little bit and how great it is to travel in Belize. Um, and so this, as this slide you're looking at now, you can see um, our, our um, next month's program I'll touch on at the end. We'll cover red-shouldered hawks. Um, let me think if I'm forgetting anything else. I don't think so. So with that, I will um, give you a little background on Ryan. So Ryan Phillips has focused his work on avian ecology and conservation in California and Belize and Central America. Ryan received his Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Conservation Biology and Fisheries with a specialization in ornithology from the University of California at Davis and an MS in Environmental Studies at San Jose State University studying neotropical raptor migration. He's been an adjunct instructor at De Anza College in the Kirsch Center for Environmental Studies since 2008. Ryan's worked with a wide variety of species, including non-avian species, focusing on their ecology and threats to assist with assessing their status and implementing conservation efforts. Ryan is the director and founder of the Belize Hawk Watch with the Belize Bird Conservancy, a nonprofit organization he co-founded in 2009. He's been studying neotropical raptors since 2004, where he lived in Belize as a field biologist for the Peregrine Fund on the Belize Harpy Eagle Restoration Project to assist in restoring a population and to study the ecology of post-release captive bred eagles. That would be a really cool future lunch and learn, by the way, yeah. Ryan. We'll have Happy to chat to do about it. that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. During that during that time and beyond, he also monitored nests of the rare orange-breasted falcon and studied neotropical species, which there is little information on, such as solitary eagle, stygian owl, ornate hawk eagle, and hook-billed kite. Since 2016, Ryan's been part of a burrowing owl recovery team in California to save the burrowing owl from local extirpation in the San Francisco Bay Area. So all things raptors for you, Ryan. Yeah, a lot of so, raptors, for sure. We're so excited um, to have you speak to us today. Um, so welcome. Thanks so much, Julie. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Hamana. Okay, so today 
We're going to talk about hook belt kites. Thanks for everybody for joining. Um, when you think of hook belt kites, typically what I hear is South Texas. That's where I got my life for a hook belt kite. Um, but you can go down to Belize and see up to a thousand in a day as possible. So um, this was recently, relatively recently discovered in the late 1990s by Lee Jones, this migration. Um, and then we started monitoring this migration in 2013. So before I jump into raptor migration, I wanted to give a little background on um, Belize and what Belize is all about. Um, I know Belize has become really pop popular with ecotourism. So I would wanted to start with that. So we're going to take a little migration down to Belize and just think of a country. If you've been to Central America, um, there's a lot of deforestation. It's kind of patchy forest. But if you go to Belize, um, it's relatively intact still, about 65 to 70 percent intact of its original habitat. Um, that's changing fast. But think of a place that has um, vast um, tracts of tropical forest or subtropical forest still intact, where you can see jaguars, harpy eagles, crested eagles, and stuff that needs these large tracts to survive. Um, so this was my fourth day, no, let's see, my 10th day in Belize. And I ended up in Belize, I had two options, I was gonna go to Peru or Belize, and I ended up in Belize, and it was the best choice that I made. And this was my 10th day in Belize. And you go to Belize or any, you know, place really in the world and you don't really think that you're going to see cats but um in my three years living in this conservation area Rio Bravo in the northwest I saw 22 jaguars I mean that's just insane um if you go to Belize you may or may not see one there's a chance that you could um don't expect it but they're out there and um they're high density of them as well um hopefully some of you that are listening to this have been to Belize so you understand um, kind of the protected areas that they do have. And here's a map that shows protected areas. And some are more protected than others as far as rangers. Uh, but if you look at a map, you can see that, you know, there's a lot of intact and protected areas and large tracts as well, too. So this makes Belize a very special place as well. If you don't know where Belize is, just to orient yourself here. Um, it's a small little country. You can drive across it in about two and a half hours and it's on the Caribbean coast and it's it's a real gem. And if you've never heard of Belize, check it out because there's so many different ecosystems, habitats, has the large, second largest uh, barrier reef in the world. And it also has a lot of history, Mayan history and current Mayan archeology span and still Mayan culture um, throughout. So it's a real, neat special place so so before i jump into like hooked out kites and raptor migration i just kind of want to talk about the motivation because not a lot of people are studying neotropical raptors it's their challenging group to study um it's uh harsh conditions to do conduct research in um, some of these birds you'll never see them because they're very uh, you know secretive like forest falcons and hookbill kites in the breeding season, they're very difficult to find. Um, but during migration, we see a lot of them. So we know they're there. Um, this is a harpy eagle that was shot and killed. This was in South America. And when I was working on the harpy eagle project, we released uh, 17 birds and most of them were shot and killed. And so the motivation for this Belize Bird Conservancy that I co-founded with Ronnie and a bunch of other folks um, is um, focused on training locals, getting locals excited about protecting birds and raptors and learning more about it and overall protecting habitat and the environment. So raptors were being persecuted. There was a lack of local involvement. It was for the Harpy Project, it was foreigners like myself coming down and tracking these birds, but there wasn't a lot of local involvement. So with the Belize Bird Conservancy, we wanted to change that. And I mean, you pick any of these neotropical species and we know nearly nothing about them. So 
Um, we're losing species. They're ex being extirpated from certain areas and we, we don't know anything about it. So it's a, there's a lot of opportunity to study these birds. Um, and then habitat loss. If you look at Central America, it's one of the, the uh, highest rates of deforestation anywhere in the world. And so that's, that's alarming. So we need to better understand these species and it has the highest biodiversity anywhere in the world. So it's important. So in 2009, we co-founded Belize Bird Conservancy, which then it was the Belize Raptor Research Institute focused on just raptors, but we've made it a bigger um, umbrella organization covering all bird species in Belize. So hopefully most of you have been to the Neotropical region. Um, it spans from Mexico through South America. Some people say could go into Texas with some of those species. Some people do not include Mexico in the Neotropical region, but um, it is included in Mexico. Um, greatest biodiversity, like I mentioned, and it holds a third of all raptor species globally. So this is a critical place for raptor conservation and research. Um, despite this richness, we know very, very little. And so we're trying to unravel it. And when we've been conducting this research on neotropical raptors, we often have more questions than we have answers. And we're just trying to create information, um, um, fill these information gaps on raptor ecology and their needs before they disappear. And this picture right here is a big sinkhole in the middle of this this Mayan biosphere reserve um, out in the middle of nowhere where orange-breasted falcons nest. So we did a lot of flyovers looking for potential nest sites. And uh, then we'd ground truth them and hike into these areas, which was a pretty amazing experience. So lots of neotropical raptor species. Here's a few that are kind of my favorites, laughing falcon, orange-breasted falcon, and of course the hook-billed kite that we're gonna talk about today. Um, these are critical components in maintaining tropical ecosystems. So the more we can better understand these species, the better we can protect these ecosystems. Um, we know they're declining due to anthropogenic factors such as deforestation. And people often ask me, well, what about climate change? Um, there hasn't been a lot of research done on it, but we know that species are being impacted by climatic change. Like Ronnie and I were just talking about, you know, it should be wet down there and a lot of water in Belize, but it's been dry um, the last couple of months. So that's impacting species and how they move. And so we need to bridge these information gaps to help conserve these species. So this is high research, research priority and, and it's challenging, I get it. Um, but we can't just say it's challenging and not do it. So we're here to answer some questions and better understand these species. Um, and one challenge too is funding because funding is tough in Central America. Um, usually it's you know funding from the US or Europe and not a lot of local funding. So it's challenging to keep these projects going. Okay, so let's talk about the Hawk Watch, Belize Hawk Watch. So, this started in 2003, it's a fall count. And right here is the site, it's in Southern Belize. And it's in this little town called Catalanding, this village called Catalanding near Punta Gorda. And here's kind of some routes that species typically take when they hit this migration site. Um, some come through Veracruz and hit Southern Belize, but most of our birds come from the Yucatan or the island hop from Florida down through Cuba and then hit the tip of the Yucatan or some cross across the Gulf like we know as swallowtail kites do. So we wanted to collect a baseline of information. There's never, before this study, there was never, um, there was no information on migration in Belize. We had some anecdotal information, but there was um, kind of this conventional wisdom that there was this information gap between Veracruz, Mexico, which we know is like the largest migration site in the world just north of Belize there, and Costa Rica, which they just started up recently again, which is great news. And this is kind of the conventional wisdom theory. This is from Bildstein 2004. And these species stick to the Pacific coast. So they come through Veracruz and they take the shortest route going along the Pacific coast or central Guatemala, and they totally miss Belize. And so, 
we will inform you that that's not necessarily the case. There's more to it. It's more complex than that. It's not a simple migration route like that route that we've conventionally thought was the route. Here's our site. It's right along the coast in Southern Belize. There's this cattle landing. This is a big soccer field here. And there, we have a little coconut tree right here with our little cover because it gets very hot. You'll get a nice tan if you're down there a couple of days. <laughs> And typically these birds are moving uh, north to south, right along the, co the uh, coastline there as a leading line. And here's the crew. There's our International Hawk Migration Week poster there. Thanks, Julie. And, <laughs> and this was our first opening. This was September 15th. 2013 this was our first day exciting day the whole community came out we had hundreds visit the site we got the excitement around bird migration and raptor migration and a lot of people had no idea what we were doing out there um, but we informed them and showed them migrating birds and they were excited especially the kiddos um, there's a school right next to the hawk site and every day at lunch they'd come on over check out the scopes and binoculars and and asked lots of really great questions. And our team was out there to answer those questions and show them some informational stuff, which was, that's, that's the coolest part, you know? So we can do all this great science and publish all these great papers, but really it's connecting all these kiddos to this um, effort. So more into the science stuff here. So here are our goals with this Hawk Watch. Um, we wanted to just determine what species are moving through, number one, but also what the magnitude and timing. And it's not as obvious as we thought it would be. And it's still, we're still trying to piece it all together after 10 years of this count. Um, but we were focused on the hookbill kite migration and still are today because that's the, the largest migration of raptors, hookbill kites in Belize. And we found that out through this count. And we want to compare Belize to Mexico. And we really want to make this a community-based project. We want to get people out. And so we started a lot of outreach and we have this uh, Raptor certification program where we bring in locals. We do five days in class and then we do 20 days of hawk watching. And they get to choose their days over that whole season, which is two and a half months. And it's been very successful. Research objectives, kind of same idea. So we want to look at characterizing this migration with hookbill kites, determine population demographics because we can identify ages and also sex. Um, we want to determine if this was a differential migration. And then we also want to look at model how precipitation and weather patterns influence this migration. So I think understanding hookbill kites will help to understand why the migration timing potentially, and also um, what's happening with this migration. So if you look at any range map, here's the range map. So Southern Texas, typically, you know, all the ABA birders get all excited right here, Southern Texas. And that's the tip of their Northern range. And then they go all the way down into the um, Argentina. So they have a pretty wide range, but if you look at this map, they're considered resident throughout. They're non-migratory according to this map. Um, so are they really resident? I'll give you the answer now instead of the cliffhanger, but no, they're not resident only. They're snail specialists, and we did some breeding studies as well. We found that they triple brooded in a single season. And that was not even in the same nest. So they would build multiple nests. They'd fledge young, start building another nest, not in the same nest, and within like 100 meters of that first nest. Fledge young, lay eggs, and then um, do it all over again. They did that three times in a row, at least this pair did. And so the breeding season is very prolonged. And maybe that's why this migration is very late, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But we found they fed primarily on this orthalicus species of snail, which is an arboreal, terrestrial arboreal snail, typically. And so they're very, very specialized, not just in snails, land snails, but maybe arboreal snails as well, too. But we've seen um, that they will shift to non-arboreal snails as well, if there's no arboreal snails present. 
they use a wide variety of habitats. That's why their range is so wide. Um, and they have this long breeding season. It's synchronized with the wet season. So that's why I wanted to model precipitation to see if precipitation had any effect on this migration, which I'll talk about here in a bit. So it's been described as both resident and migratory. You see the range map shows it or resident only. Um, and then Bildstein categorized it as facultative or local migrant, which we'll talk about. And migration has been observed only in a few places, and it's mostly anecdotal data except for Veracruz, which started observing hookbill kites migrating in 1993. Um, each season, they have less than 200 individuals passing through there. So there is a migration, but it's um, few few birds. In Belize in 99, Lee Jones estimated that there's 5,000 hookbill kites and a lot of people did not believe him. Hookbill kites, 5,000, they don't migrate like that. So he started doing a couple of little like studies for a couple of years and found that, yeah, there's a lot of hookbill kites moving through. Um, and that's when we started in 2013 to answer the question, is there really 5,000 migrating through? In Costa Rica in 2018, there was some evidence of some migrating hookbill kites. They had like 16 birds moving through. Um, and then northern South America and northern Brazil, there was a flock of about 35, and they had some other evidence of migration. So we don't know if those are birds from the, below the equator, and they're like migrating north, opposite of when these birds are migrating. Um, but there's a lot more questions. So complex and a mystery. So we're just trying to unravel this mystery. What makes you, uh, hookbill kites unique is that they have varied plumage. And so you can see a variety of plumages here from fe adult female, adult male. There's light morphs, which are these two. There's dark morphs. And here's, um, here's uh, juveniles. And these have gone through a preformative molt here. And some juveniles are completely white that have not gone through a preformative molt. So there's a lot of variation. Here's a juvenile dark morph bird. And some of these adults have a lot of banding and barring in the wings, and some don't. So there's a lot of variation. And then here's, look at this flock of hookbill kites. I mean, just this is like a dream flock right here. Down low, good lighting, lots of birds. So this makes, this affords the opportunity to look at population demographics and differential migration. And here's, if you come down to the Hawk Watch, everyone's invited down there, please come down. This is a flock of 41 hookbill kites passing over in a stream headed south. You can hear the excitement of the crew. <laughs> I mean, just imagine that, right? You're excited about two hookbill kites in South Texas, but come on down. And here's another flock that's a low, they're starting to lift early in the morning. They probably roosted near the count site and they're just lifting and looking for those thermals. Pretty awesome. So into the numbers here in the data a bit. Um, so there's a lot of, we could discuss this for days. There's a lot of information here. Um, there's a lot of information here, um, but the takeaway from this is, so these are migrants only. So on average, we get 8,671 migrating raptors a season, and we count about 15 to 20,000 raptors in total, resident birds as well as migrants. Um, what's most interesting here um, is hookbill kites, they averaged 5,382. So Lee Jones had it dead on. But what's interesting is that the first year we did the count, it was 744. And we we just said, what's going on here? There's not 5,000 birds. What's Lee talking about? And then the next year we got exactly 5,000. And you can see it varies from year to year. And in 2020, we had a huge year. And that was almost 10,000 birds, hookbill kites counted. So there's a lot of questions here, and we'll try to hash this out a little bit today. Um, 
double tooth kites were not known to migrate in Belize or anywhere in the range. And so we do have migration, evidence of migration. These birds move every year. They're moving north to south. They're in a migration. And we get on average 60 double tooth kites along the coast. Inland, there's more migration going on with the species. So we want to look at that migration in the future. And then you remember that map, that conventional wisdom map that showed that all these Nearctic species, they move along the Pacific coast. Well, we have a big migration of Mississippi kites and Mississippi kites were first discovered in Belize migrating in the late 1990s only. And that was like one individual. And so we found a pretty major migration of Mississippi kites and they're all juveniles. So they're probably just off course that normal route, but this is significant maybe to monitor juveniles only. And then as well as broadwing hawks. Broadwing hawks are considered rare in Belize, uncommon, and there's a significant migration through Belize. So a lot we can say about these numbers, um, but let's focus on that hook-billed kite migration. So hook-billed kites in Belize, we've counted in 10 years, we counted 52,823 hook-billed kites during almost 4,000 hours of count time. Annual mean, we talked about 5,300. And then in last year, we had a mega day with 2,068 hook-billed kites counted in a single day. This is November 10th. And we've had five days with 1,000 birds or more in a single day. So this was an exceptional day. And the reason was that um, Hurricane Lisa came through and the birds were just getting stacked up and there was no movement. It cleared up and there was still no movement. I go, oh, just birds not going to migrate this year. And then all of a sudden it just opened up a few days later and we had this major count and it was followed. The prior day actually was 1,613 birds the prior day. So in a matter of two days, we had over 3,000 hook bill kites migrating through, which is just insane. In comparison, Mexico in 25 years has counted 3,870 hook bill kites. And on average, they get 154. So I want you to focus, we'll talk about this in a minute here, focus on this increase in Belize of hook bill kites. So if you look at RPI and looking at raptor population, you say, oh, this looks great. They're increasing, looks good to me. Should be no issues. Um, but let's talk about why that may be not the case. Um, so here's the numbers again, and you can see this. I just wanna show this for the variation between years. And that's pretty significant. That's not just birds going inland, that is actual variation because we've done inland counts as well too. And then this is just a comparison. Let's go through this real quick, but just a comparison between the Mexico sites and Belize, and you can just see that Belize is a significant corridor for this migration. So probably most of these birds are coming from the Yucatan Peninsula in that region south of Veracruz. So timing-wise, I think just the overall message is that this is a late migration and probably has to do with that breeding very late so they don't leave until pretty late. Um, peak migrations around November 11th, November 10th. Here it says November 15th for 50% passage. And it's about a month different from Mexico, which is about, seems about right, maybe a little long. Um, then the question of differential migration, you know, with a lot of species in North America, or the United States, it's, you know, juveniles go first or vice versa, adults go first. And there's this differential migration between ages and also sexes potentially. We don't see that with hook-billed kites. They all go at the same time. They're mixed flock. There's juveniles with adults. There's females with males. And there's no timing differential. So dark morphs, just some facts here. Dark morphs represent 13% of the population, which is in interesting. Um, it's higher than I thought it would be. And adults represent about 70% of this migration. If you're wondering when to go to the hawk, site during the day the golden hour we call it is 10 to 11 you will see a nice migration between 9 and 11 most of the birds pass through during that time so if you're down there you can sleep in a little bit and then come in at nine and you'll see this migration um, 
And then flock sizes, the largest flock we've seen, which was last year, was 288 individuals. And our average flock size is 7.6. Um, this all depends on timing and how many birds we see pass through in a given season. The higher the flocks, the greater the flocks, the greater the count. This influence of precipitation. So for my thesis, I did some modeling of precipitation and it suggested that um, there was no influence on the timing or magnitude in Belize. Um, but it did show that there was this influence of timing in Mexico, where if it was a rainy season, birds would migrate later, which makes perfect sense. Um, but that did not show in Belize, which is interesting. And here is the study site. So here's Belize count site down here. Here's Veracruz, there are two count sites. And here's all the weather stations where I took data from. So to migrate or not to migrate. So some of these birds are obviously choosing, probably based on the conditions, maybe the snail abundance, maybe some years they migrate and some years they don't. So this, these terms facultative versus obligate, meaning facultative, they kind of, I don't like the word choose, but depending on certain conditions at that time, they migrate or they don't. Versus obligate migration where every single year about the same time they're migrating out. And some people say, oh, they're genetically programmed where facultative aren't, but um, they are gen facultative migration is genetically programmed as well to choose to migrate or not. So that's important to understand. I heard that misconception sometimes. So there's, a, there's this extreme annual variation in Belize, which suggests that there is a facultative migration, which Bildstein suggests. Um, but there's no differential migration, which also suggests facultative. And the timing is relatively the same each year, but and there is always birds migrating. So this suggests that there's for sure an obligate, like local migratory population somewhere, most likely. Um, or just in certain years, in certain areas where microclimates exist, the conditions are different and those birds move out where other years in different areas, those birds do not move. So a lot more questions than answers. So what, what's the conclusion of this? This is a complex migration and we have more questions even after 10 years studying this bird. We don't know where they go to. There's not a significant migration in Costa Rica. So are they just going to Nicaragua, settling down there for a few months and then heading back north? Um, we don't know. So hopefully soon we can start fitting some trackers on these birds to understand this. But some people say this is complex, but this is pretty common and probably more common in the neotropical region where we have these intratropical migrations. Um, it's probably pretty common actually that this happens where there's this flexibility depending on conditions and resources. So what triggers this movement? So precipitation had some effect um, and Mexico seemed like a better like um, effect there on migration as far as timing. Um, we know it precipitation impacts species locally. Um, we've seen this in Texas, Dr. Brush, um, I think he's in here today. Um, maybe you can comment on this. There was uh, a <clears throat> local declines of snails and then the kites obviously disappeared when there was no food base. I think it was multiple years of drought that caused this. Um, obviously now there's hookbill kites that are back, but um, once they lose that resource, they have to move. So we need to further understand what influences this really dynamic um, migration. You know, these birds are migrating through December even, and maybe some of these birds are even migrating through January and then migrating back only a couple months later. So. We, and then everybody says, why are you studying the birds? Study the snails, you know, that'll tell you everything. You know, well, I'm not a snail biologist, I'm a raptor biologist. And, and so we need to understand what these snails are doing as well too. So we know that snails are influenced by weather even in the neotropical region. So we just need to understand um, what those um, influences Peter, are. Peter, how does that work oh, if they to come back? Yeah. Julie. And then um, 
this may have implications for climate change as we don't really understand how it's going to impact these species. We know it will, um, but what are those implications? So this is one idea. So if you look, so what's going on in Belize? So if you look at, is this graph right here, population growth, or is this something else going on? And so if you did like an RPI, you'd say, oh yeah, this is great. There's population growth, hook bill kites are doing great. Maybe they're even increasing. But looking at the bigger picture here and kind of fine scale stuff, um, if you look at uh, forest cover in 2000, in this region, Yucatan in particular, compared to 2019, 2020, and 20 year difference, look at the deforestation rate. It's alarming. I don't think that hookbill kites, a forest species, would be increasing in a situation like this. So why are we seeing more individuals moving? I don't know the answer to that, but what we can say is that maybe it is, this has some impact. So species, when they have no resources, they have to move. And so maybe we're seeing a movement, a greater movement because there's less habitat and less resources. So they're going further south where maybe there's more snails, more habitat and more resources. I don't know, but it needs to be looked at. Um, if you look at deforestation, 8% loss in this region in 20 years, that's alarming. Belize, similar fate. And I think Belize is about 11% forest lost in 20 years. So yeah, we have a lot of protected lands in Belize and some intact habitat, but it's also being deforested, um, especially with the growing population in Belize. So this may be a migratory response to increase the loss of habitat rather than an increase in population. Um, because if you look at kind of the theories on predators and prey um, availability, either species move in two ways. They functionally switch um, prey or, I mean, adapt to these situations where they lose resources. So they either switch prey or they um, move. They have to move. So we see a lot of movement. That's why migration probably you know, evolved was because of resources. A species like the hookbill kite is highly, highly specialized. It probably cannot adapt fast enough like we're seeing with a lot of the Hawaiian species and these other island species. Um, so therefore they probably have to move. So that's maybe why we're seeing this migration. And this could be a potential serious conservation concern in the neotropics, not just for hookbill kites, but all species as well. So this needs to be looked at um, and investigated further going into the Yucatan Peninsula and kind of ground truthing, looking at um, success of hookbill kite nests. So we need more studies, more investigation, more research. This is a great opportunity to study a neotropical species, um, maybe as a bioindicator of the neotropical region. Um, looking at land snail ecology is important and how they adapt or change to um, habitat loss as well as climate change. There's other evidence that um, arboreal snails do not do well during deforestation habitat loss, which makes sense because they live in trees. Um, and there needs to be some population studies looking at where these birds are going, where are they overwintering or non-breeding season versus breeding season and how this um, habitat loss could be driving this migration. So this is critical. So that's hookbill kites kind of in a nutshell, quick overview. We could talk about this for days, um, but I also wanted to mention some other interesting finds that we've had during this count. Um, every year we don't really know what to expect. So it makes it very interesting and keeps the count going. Um, I know a lot of counts are just like, we know what to expect and we see it and that happens, but this count is, is intriguing in that every year we find something different. Um, this bird right here changed the way we looked at double tooth kites. This was the first documentation of hookbill kites migrating. This is a juvenile bird. And the first year we had zero, if you look at that table, zero birds in 2013. We weren't looking for hookbill kites. We didn't know they migrated. And these high flying birds look a lot like occipiters, sharp shin hawks. Um, now we now they look very different to us, long wings, just underwing coverts, a lot of different things in the tail. 
Uh, but before we weren't really picking these guys out. This bird flew really low over the count site. I got a picture of it. And we immediately identified it as a double tooth kite and said, oh, that's strange. There's no, not many records along the coast. And then we started looking for these birds and found that there's a migration. And then we get about 60 birds uh, a year. So overall message of this hawk watch, it's an important, Belize is an important raptor migratory corridor, especially along the coast that needs to be looked at further and preserved. And it's not just for these intratropical migrations, swallowtail kites migrate through, Mississippi kites, broad-winged hawks also use it. So, and what's interesting about this site and Belize in general with raptor migration is that it's one of the longest migrations probably documented. Um, it's actually, there's pretty much a migration happening every month of the year. Um, Plumbius kites, double-toothed, and swallow-tailed kites start migrating in as early as July, early July. And then hook-billed kites are migrating all the way through December and even early July. So you have a fall migration, fall migration, that's going from early July to early January. So we're talking about a long, long migration. And then some of these birds that are moving north start moving as early as early February. So you essentially have migration all year long in Belize. And it's not just about the science part of it. For me, it's a lot about connecting people to raptor ecology, raptor research, raptor conservation. And these are the future of um, raptor conservation in Belize. And Ronnie could attest to this. He's the one that teaches this in-class um, in course, the five-dayer. And it's gotten very, very popular. And you can see here, they give a presentation during this um, we call it the theory course. And they uh, then they go into the field for 20 days as a practical and to complete their certification program, it's a 25 day program. So it's uh, very popular and we already have 13 signups for this year. So really exciting. So it's just about connecting people. I think that's the only way we can do conservation and preserve these raptor migrations and raptor populations is connecting these people um, and all people to these projects. So I know some of, hopefully some of you are in this talk are going on this amazing trip. We partnered with Hamana um, to do this tour, raptor tour with Bill Clark, who's in here and Ronnie Martinez and um, Julie and Phil. And we're going to do this, we're doing this raptor tour in November during what peak migration. So you guys will be down at the Hawk Watch during peak migration, which is November 11th, 12th, 10th, somewhere in there. And hopefully you get a good migration. I'm not promising a thousand bird day, but you never know. And it all kind of depends on the weather as well. These hurricanes each year have really shifted the way birds moved and how many move. So if you get a hurricane or a good tropical storm coming through a week or two before, you maybe get a huge, huge push. And of course, we don't want a hurricane during this trip, but it does cause for excitement um, in the bird world and migration. So just to whet your appetite a little bit here, um, these are all my pictures from years of being down in Belize, but this is an orange-breasted falcon at a sinkhole that we were studying a nest. Nairi. And this is one of the probably the one of the rarest falcons in the world. I mean, there's just a plethora of like amazing raptors in Belize. It's a laughing falcon. It's a snake specialist, feeds only on snakes. And the, everybody loves the hawk eagles. That's my favorite group. This is a black and white hawk eagle. It's the rarest of the three in Belize. This is an ornate hawk eagle, a nest I was studying. Um, in Rio Bravo in the north part of Belize. There's a little youngster right here. So Black Hawk Eagle, my favorite raptor right there. And these are relatively common. If you do a 10 day trip in Belize, you should get at least a Black Hawk Eagle and ornate if you're in the right places and potentially a Black and White Hawk Eagle as well, all three species. One of the harder, more elusive, you hear them all the time all over the forest, but to actually see them, um, I chased these guys around when I first went down to Belize in 2004 for a year. I chased these guys. I heard this barking barred forest falcon all over the forest. 
chase them down and you'd get right underneath them. You just can not never get a good view of them. So elusive little guys, but sometimes you get lucky and they pop right up in front of you like this guy. This is a black colored hawk. Um, on this tour, we're going to go to, you guys will go to Crooked Tree and these are relatively common in Crooked Tree. You should get them. One of the neat species down there, Neotropical species, crane hawk, these double jointed where they can reach into tree cavities and pick out youngsters, nestlings. The king vulture, relatively common, declining definitely in parts of their range. But who doesn't love a white hawk over a tropical forest? You know, that's just an amazing bird to see on top of, especially. This is one of the rare birds. This is the bird I studied in. Uh, Mountain Pine Ridge, which this tour goes to, it's the solitary eagle. There's only been one nest ever studied, which we studied in Belize. And there's only been about seven nests found of the species and none were studied except for the one in Belize. So we had this really rare opportunity to um, get great pictures like this and to study plumage and nesting and breeding ecology of the species. So consider supporting us. Um, we're on a shoestring budget. It's hard for funding. We have a GoFundMe campaign going on now. Um, here's our website. You can visit our website. Here's an email if you just have questions or um, any information. You can just email us. Um, but here's part of the crew. This is right after they set the record last year with the 2,000 birds. Uh, pretty amazing. So thanks for listening. I'll take any questions. Thanks so much, Ryan. Those yeah, were fantastic so. images, and I'm sure you can guarantee that we'll have some great looks like that on the upcoming <laughs> tour. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that really whet folks' appetite for uh, for that trip, I'm sure. And um, uh, and yeah, you're doing some fantastic work with raptors and with people alike, and it really is aligned well with the the whole uh, mission of Hamana. So um, yeah, great that we're we're partnering with you. And, uh, Thanks, Phil. Oh, and then also one thing to add to, I forgot to mention, one of our first grants was through Hamana on our second year in Hawkwatch, I think it was. So we appreciate that. That jump started us. So thanks, Hamana, for that. Yeah. Yeah. Glad to support this good work. Um, so we did get a bunch of questions that I'll jump into and uh, hopefully yeah. can summarize them well here. Uh, so I'll first note that uh, Esther chimed in that migration of hook-billed kites are also uh, occurring and documented in Colombia. So that may be some new information for you, or maybe you're aware of that. Yeah, um, that's great. Yeah, I mean, the more counts we have, the more eyes we have out there, we can determine what's going on with this migration. Those might be birds from below the equator too. So timing-wise, we have to, yeah, look at that. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. Carl asks, um, do you do any tracking of the birds? Are you banding hook-billed kites at cattle landing? Um, uh, are there any obstacles such as lack of funding to that sort of work, which may help yeah. answer a lot of questions? Yeah, definitely. So right here, this is like top priority for us. That's the next step is getting some trackers on these birds. And in communication with CTT, they have some trackers that will work with um, hook bill kites. So we're looking at that and hopefully in the next year to two years, we'll get some, hopefully by, I'd say a year, we'll get some trackers on these birds to determine where they're going, what's happening here. Are they migrating every year? These individuals. So yeah. Yep. It's on nice. the, in the books. Funding is a challenge for sure. Um, so ha yeah, if you want to see this happen, help donate. Um, that always helps. Um, but yeah, we're, that's the goal is to get some oh, tracker on these birds. That would really help uh, figure out a few mysteries, I'm sure, and, and probably yeah. lead to a whole bunch of more questions too. Absolutely, yeah. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll ask uh, my question next. Um, I, I was curious about the, um, the previous documentation of hook-billed kite migration, such as what indigenous peoples may have noticed or locals in the area. Um, I know, you know, it's kind of new to modern science, but is this yeah. something that you had found uh, you know, from the locals you had spoken with in the community? Yeah, good happening? question. Thanks for that question, Phil. Yeah. Um, the local communities were are deeply connected to the forest and to birds um, going back, you know, 
thousands of years. Um, so I'm sure they witnessed migration. I'm sure it was, you know, greater birds then as well too. Um, as far as um, locals, the knowledge like with forest species, um, I would say they, the knowledge is pretty strong there. Um, but as far as migration, there wasn't a lot known. And I think because a lot of these birds, they fly very, very high. So well, without the aid of binoculars and scopes, they could be hard to see. And I think that's why hook, or, um, sorry, Mississippi kites went unnoticed for a long time is because they fly super high and they just pass through in a few days, you know. And so they're really hard to see. So I can't say that nobody's witnessed this migration. I'm sure it's been witnessed by many local peoples and indigenous peoples as well, too. But there's just no records of it. So, yeah. Sure. Okay, thanks for that. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for that question. Julie asks, how common it is for neotropical species to triple brood and multiple nests? And are there other examples of species that do the same yeah, good question. We were blown away by it. We're like, these got to be different birds, but no, they were the same birds. It's never been documented ever in a raptor community where birds triple brood successfully three times in different nests. So there's records of birds triple brooding typically after failures, which is Harris's hawks. And there's a kestrel as well to, I forget what species, but there's a kestrel species as well that's been documented to triple brood. And there may be one other species. Maybe Bill can help answer that as well too, Bill Clark. Um, but yeah, it's never been documented to be successful in multiple nests in a season, which is, and we we publish that. It's in um, Journal of Raptor Research, we publish that. Thanks, yeah, Bill, I, I don't know if Bill is able to chime in right now, but feel free to chime in if you have the answer to that question. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's a new new phenomenon that's very interesting, and maybe it's a phenomenon within neotropical species that we just haven't observed. But okay. I think it's during like years where there's a lot of snails available because they're taking hundreds and hundreds of snails just for one nest. So it's got to be a really plentiful year. On the topic of snails, um, we have uh, some observations and questions here. Um, Paz notes that uh, hook-billed kites are expanding in parts of Costa Rica due to a pest snail, an invasive snail, I guess, mm. and may maybe also in parts of Mexico and Brazil. Um, uh, Ronnie shared a, a link to a book about land snails of Belize and Central America, so I guess there are some resources out there, but obviously a less, less understood and less studied um, animal. Yeah, and um, and Paz mentioned that only five of the 183 known snails in Costa Rica are uh, well understood as far as their natural history goes. So that yeah, that same thing with knowledge. across the whole neotropical region is that same issue. We don't know anything about them. I mean, even the snail experts in Belize who wrote that book, Ronnie shared. We don't know. We don't know that some of their ecology, especially these arboreal snails, where we have to go in the canopy. Yeah. And is that part of your future uh, research goal then? To yeah, out did I put that on land there? snail ecology? There we oh, go. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's yes. the one. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see, precipitation question. Um, well, actually a comment from Tim uh, sharing that severe droughts and also flooding may seem to be impacting the South Texas population, but he was celebrating the return of hook-billed kites in South Texas. Yeah, that's um, good news. Everybody was excited to see that. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for that, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks for your information sharing. Steve Hoffman asks about the dates for the, the uh, count each year. Do you have set start and end oh, dates yeah. or is it somewhat flexible? Yeah. Thanks for that. I didn't put that in here. So we count October 1st to December 15th. Our first year, we were counting September 15th through December 1st, but we saw that the hookbill kite migration was very late, later than we thought. So we shifted that the second year. So we missed so the reason you don't see like plumbius kites and Mississippi kite, or sorry, and swallowtail kites in the graph and the table is because we missed that migration because we start so late. They mostly go through in um, August and September. 
here. So here you go. So that's why we only have a few small tail kites. We missed the migration. Is there any attempt to uh, to expand at some point? Any thought of trying to expand the season down the road? <laughs> it's a long season. If we had funding, yeah. we could do it. And also, like a lot of our day leaders are tour guides as well, lodge guides. So they don't have, they can't get that time off. So if we could get funding and like permanent day leaders and project leads, then absolutely we would do that. We tried um, a couple of years ago, we did a study on plumbius kites and double tooth kites and started monitoring in July and found the migration in July. And then peak migration for swallowtail kites is mid August and the Mississippi kites start right after it. So it'd have to be a migration count season from July 15th to December 15th. So we need some funding for that. And Hopefully people, that's down the road. Hopefully it's yeah, some point. I think it would be to grow toward. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. A few more questions here. Yeah. A lot of good engaged questions here. Um, awesome. One that came in about um, the counters themselves. These are paid counters we're imagining. Yeah. They're paid yeah. counters. Okay. Yeah. We have a uh, set day leaders I've had for eight years. We've gone through some day leaders. Um, but yeah, we have a good solid crew. We've added this year, we're adding another day leader that's gone through the certification program and is we're going to get them trained up and ready to be a day leader. And um, yeah, it's kind of every year is a little different, but depending on people's availability, but we got a good solid crew that's been involved for most of the time. Yeah. And it's they're all paid. Yeah. And it's tough because some live in like Northern Belize. So they spend weeks at a time in Southern Belize away from their families. So it's, it's tough for them, but they're dedicated and excited and we bring a lot of people down. So. Great. Um, let's see a few more have just come in. So let me just get to maybe two last yeah. questions here. Thanks for fielding. If them, you're Phil. good on the time and we're coming up on one o'clock here. Yeah. Um, uh, question about the brood size. Do you happen to have that information? Yeah. Brood size. They have two eggs typically and two, two young. Eggs. Yeah. We've seen, uh, Let's see, have we seen, we've never seen three, only two. So one to two young, they fledge, or zero to two young, they fledge. Yeah. Uh, Carl asks, what is the legal status of hunting migratory birds, especially raptors? And is it still a problem? Is it a big problem? Yeah, it's the major issue in Belize, persecution, direct persecution. It's not hunting. I wouldn't say hunting because they're not hunting them for food. They're just hunting them for persecution to kill them because there's a lot of, there's a misconception that every single raptor takes their domestic animals. Yeah. And then with Harpy, when I was working with Harpy Eagles, I heard it a lot that that Eagle can take my kid. You know, I don't want that Eagle around. And so it's a lot of more fear. Um, and Hey, it's taking my chickens. I'm trying to make a living, which you understand their, their worries about it. Um, there was a solitary Eagle that was killed in a village and, the bird was coming down near their chickens, but if you understand solitary eagles, they only feed on, or they primarily feed on snakes. So it's probably actually taking a snake near, that was probably taking the chickens. And so we try to inform them about, you know, what these species, the importance of these species. And they go, oh, what, it was eating snakes? Oh, I shouldn't have killed that bird. What was I doing? You know, so it's, it's a lot of just like working closely with, um, these people. And I think it really comes not from me or from foreigners, but from the, the locals themselves. And so that's why I bring this team on board. Yeah. That's, that's a fantastic approach to uh, engage the local audience so they can be the ambassadors. Um, I think that will be the last question here. I, I'm sorry if we missed one or two here, but um, we're at one o'clock and I wanted to turn it over to Julie so she can summarize and uh, thank everybody. So thank you, Phil. Ryan, for answering thank all those you, questions. Phil. And great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Ryan, and thanks, Phil, for for those questions. Um, I before I wrap up, I just wanted to um, ask Bill Clark or or, Ron, or Ronnie Martinez if they want to chime in with anything. You'll be the the leaders of our tour this fall. Um, do you have any comments you want to add? Uh, you should be able to unmute yourselves if you'd like to. Or are you all set? Thanks, Ronnie and Bill, for sharing, coming and being for part sure. of it. Ronnie, um, do you want to say anything? Absolutely. I, uh, I, if I were you, I'd take advantage of like the last three spaces that are available on this tour coming up in November. We're going 
to some really sweet places for, for raptors. And I mean, a good part of this tour is the migration, but we're also going to places like Mountain Pine Ridge, um, Bocawina, which are really cool areas for, for raptors. And not just raptors, as, as Ryan mentioned, I mean, there's quite a bit of mammals and large cats around those areas. So um, if you're thinking about it and you just haven't decided yet, now's the time. Those, uh, those seats will sell pretty fast. Thanks, Ronnie. Anything okay. from you, Bill? Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I had trouble getting unmuted. First of all, uh, Ryan, thank you for a most uh, uh, wonderful and well-presented presentation and really covered the subject very well. Uh, second, Thanks, Ronnie, Bill. it's good to see your face again. I look forward to working with you. And third, you just can't do better than getting to Belize to watch neotropical raptors. And not only is English spoken there, so you don't have any language problems, uh, but the guides like Ronnie and, and all of his colleagues are really very well trained. And the birds are, uh, it just seems like you've been able to see them much closer and in much more detail and better photographs. So I'm really looking forward to this. I haven't been back for many years and it will be a nice homecoming for me. So uh, thank you, Ronnie and Ryan and Julie. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, seeing your photos, Ryan, made me think of um, photographers. You know, Haman has been leading yeah. more tours geared towards photography, raptor and bird, general bird photography. So this sounds like it would be another great opportunity if people like taking pictures. Um, so with that, I want to thank everybody for joining, um, especially Ryan. That was fabulous. Um, I really want to thank you for all your raptor monitoring efforts in Belize. Uh, we're so grateful at Hamana um, for everything you're doing. And, and Ronnie, the whole crew down there, thank you so much for, for all your efforts. Um, and if you could forward to the very last slide, Ryan, there's one um, next yeah. month's Lunch and Learn is um, going to be focusing on red shouldered hawks. So we're going to hear from, um, let's see, we're hearing from John Jacobs, and he is a researcher in Wisconsin. So we're going to be uh, hearing about his his research, uh, putting telemetry units on red shoulders. So that's going to be August 16th at 12 p.m. You can register from Hermana's Facebook page. You can register on our website also. Um, we hope you'll join us for that. Um, we have a conference that we're planning next fall. So mark your calendars for that. Uh, very different from Belize, but Northern uh, Minnesota. There'll also be some good raptors up there. And uh, again, if you want to join our e-newsletter, you can always shoot me an email at brown at Hamana or join that on our website. Um, we're also putting together some other tour plans for next year. Um, Southern Arizona in late winter. So stay tuned for that. That's not yet on our website. Um, and also um, Montana next fall in 2024 for um, Golden Eagles in um, yeah Montana. So that's going to be a, an October tour. So once again, thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, we really appreciate your support. You can always join our kettle, um, become a Hamana member at Hamana.org.